John Wick Chapter 4 has decimated the box office as well as winning the hearts of critics and audiences around the world in just its first week. Let's dive into Chapter 4 of this franchise. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. We just saw an early screening of John Wick Chapter 4, thanks to IMAX, with special guests Keanu Reeves and Chad Stahelski. It was a wonderful experience to watch this crazy, super intense film with high-octane action, excellent characters, and then to do a Q&A with Keanu Reeves afterwards. It was a magical night to just see the man, the myth, the legend in person my mind was blown it's wild how big this franchise has become chapter four you know an excellent addition to john wick and spoilers obviously in this episode we're gonna be talking about the finale and i'll probably spoil it right now the the end of john wick which is a character that i think needed to die which mm-hmm. i think was one of the best parts of the film is ending it even though they set up a whole verse but you know this you could argue is keanu's most iconic role now compared to The Matrix with Neo. I still think Neo is his best role for me and my, his most iconic role in my heart, but especially for young moviegoers and young movie lovers who've grown up with Keanu Reeves as John Wick first versus like then going to watch The Matrix. And like, oh yeah, The Matrix is cool, but yeah. they're really into John Wick versus Neo for their most iconic role that Keanu has done. That's, That's what he's kind of like yeah. more known for now. I think you're right. And this franchise has just become one of the best action franchises in cinema history. That's a fact. You know, what they did in terms of the stunts, the choreography, the changing up of fighting in movies and just the brutal nature of the gunfights, the close quarter gunfights and the jujitsu, the judo, now incorporating more martial arts in three and then number four and just the savage body counts in all <laughs> these movies. They really just changed the game of the action genre where, you know, movies like The Raid kind of just started paving the way forward, building that foundation for incredible nonstop action thrill rides with incredible fight choreography that Hollywood, I think, was craving for so long. I mean, it kind of was here in the early 2000s, but kind of just disappeared with some of those great actors like Jackie Chan, kept martial arts alive, Jet Li in Hollywood for a while. But there was kind of a, a time where it wasn't a big genre for for a bit. Yeah, that's a good point because we grew up and we had those two. Were, they, were, they were the most popular. Jason State them had a transport yeah. franchise but that was not as successful as a franchise none of those movies were huge hits but the, he did a lot of great martial arts in that film in those films but i would say that's a good point about neo and john wick because what really makes the difference between the franchises is that john wick has had consistency all of the movies are good matrix <laughs> not you can't say the same thing about it especially with the fourth entry of both these both those franchises the fourth entry of matrix uh Wish I never saw it. (laughs) Fourth entry of John Wick. I had an absolute blast and it felt right in the world. And it was a a terrific conclusion. I thought it was one of the more more satisfying conclusions to a modern franchise I've seen in a very long time. I did not want there to be a John Wick chapter nine. I did not want one last time. (laughs) He's back. He's thinking he's back. back again. (laughs) I didn't want that. So... I walked into this film hoping like I was like, oh, man, I really hope that like they're not going to keep making these because sometimes too much can be a bad thing. And stretching a a story out when it doesn't need to be stretched out too far can push the audience away, me especially. And so I was so happy with the ending of the film. I like the way that John went down kind of on his own terms. It was a really beautiful conclusion for the character. And the ending of this film got back to the heart of the first film. That I think the first one was my favorite still because I love the character arc in that. I love the reveal of the world. And then the action was so visceral and unexpected in the first film. Uh, and so, and obviously the action's better and improved and bigger and, and more complex and extravagant in the, in the latter films. But something about the action in the first film, it just felt more immediate, like more dangerous for John because we hadn't, we hadn't seen him do this for three films. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I do prefer the first film out of the whole franchise, but that's just me. I know a lot of people are absolutely adoring this film, rightfully so, because it's a very impressive film. Shot in 35 millimeter film, gorgeous cinematography. Great uh, hallmarks and homages to one of our favorite films, Lawrence of Arabia. All around incredible production design and an ex- excellent, talented new cast. I'd probably rank them 
one, three, four, two. I think Parabellum is fucking awesome. I, I think Parabellum has the best fight with the knives fight. I think that that whole movie's great, but plus Halle Berry coming in there. And I loved, not to say that I didn't love John Wick Chapter 4, because I really did, but there were some things that I will nitpick about it in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Talk about, I think the runtime was a little too much. Mm -hmm. Almost three hours. And another another conjures off the bat real quick is Keanu Reeves spoke 308 words. Yeah, he And the whole yeah, movie, 308 yeah. words. I understand that John Wick speaks with bullets and fists <laughs> and knives, <laughs> but I mean, it's a three hour movie and John Wick says 308 words. Yeah. And I know the Matrix, he had like 105 lines, but he still said a lot of words and 94 of those were questions, those lines, but still more than 308 words. So mm -hmm. like for the, for me, it felt a little bit not like a John Wick movie the first hour, but the third act of this film really was sensational, tremendous, incredible sequences like in France around the arc and the circle, as well as the overhead wonder shot in the third act was fucking awesome. I thought that was one of the coolest things I've seen all year in film. The staircase? Staircase yeah. was excellent. We'll talk about all these more in depth, but right now it's this is just a huge smash hit. It made... 135 37 million dollars in its first opening weekend it just came out and so it's just killing right now 70 million domestic 95 percent critic score on Rotten tomatoes 95 percent audience score 8.5 on imdb with 50,000 reviews so people are absolutely adoring this movie keanu reeves is the man he did 90 percent of his own stunts in this movie which was fucking awesome to see sorry dropping lots of f-bombs already i'm gonna have to edit them out it's a rated r ep uh, episode i guess <laughs> just like this rated r movie obviously Rest in peace, Lance Reddick, who mm -hmm. his character also unfortunately passes away in this film, just like he passed away in real life right around the, the premiere of this movie, which is so unfortunate because he was such a great and integral part of this world building for John Wick, mm -hmm. as well as he kicks some major ass in the other films. In the third one, yeah. Him and John with yeah. the shotguns, he, they go off, man. And also the second one, too. We got a ton of new characters in this movie. We got Shimatsu, played by Hiroki Sonata, the man from Last Samurai, so many great movies. We have Akira, Tracker, The Harbinger, Kane, played by Donnie Yen, the icon, Killa, and then the Marquis, aka Nobody. We'll get into each of these characters individually, but I still think that this movie was sensational. Had a super strong opening. The incredible, like, punching the wood opening of John Wick with yeah, the voice the sound over, design. Uh, of the Bowery yeah. Kring from uh, wow. Lawrence Fishburne. And then also, the, like Anthony yeah, brought up, the Lawrence of Arabia reference, which was the match cut of blowing out the match, cutting to the sunrise in the desert, was gorgeous. And it was like a, a contemporary version of that because it's just yeah. so much faster because <laughs> yeah. Lawrence of Arabia, it's like a two-minute sunrise. It's gorgeous. You got to mm. check it out. I, I actually tweeted that video like a month ago saying it's the greatest cut in cinema history. And then it just started going like popping on Twitter the other day because people were like, oh my God, that's from John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really love how Chad Stahelski, even though we're in this modern contemporary landscape of movies, just took something from a great movie that he probably loves and just referenced it in his movie. Well, I mean, it just goes to show you that it's clearly one of the greatest movies ever made if so many great filmmakers respect it that much and i got it i got it right here on, yeah. the, on the on the set <laughs> and they actually did film it in morocco in the same locations of as so Lewis many of the Arabia. same shots yeah i recognize a bunch of the rock formations and as well as when he kills that member of the high table in the opening of the film not exactly boom that's actually an exact spot that they filmed the scene of lawrence of arabia and so, jordan the desert yeah as well. exactly so that Lawrence of Arabia was, it was not filmed in those actual areas. They were Morocco and Jordan took the place of those deserts. So they weren't actually in the correct geogra geographical locations. Also, Dune has shot in a couple of those locations as well because some of the rock formations look so extraterrestrial in terms gotcha. of nature, <laughs> geography and nature. It's like, how is that on planet Earth? And so it's a wonder, it was a wonderful opening. And it was, I was like, I wasn't sure if it was going to be too much green screen because you just got a, a bit of it in the trailer. But they filmed that entire sequence there for real. Ten seconds into that sequence of him riding the horses, shooting, shooting down, guns. I was like, I was like, oh shit! They really filmed this in the desert. <laughs> I was like, that's really cute. Out of riding a horse in the middle of the desert, like shooting people. I was like, damn, they went there for real. So kudos to what Chad Stahelski as a director. Obviously, there's CGI and visual effects enhancements here and there, but he's a really he does a really phenomenal job of using practicality, real sets, real stunt actors. Uh, real performances obviously like when killer falls and like his head smashes on the that was a little visual effects helping that impact um but he does a wonderful job of really shooting everything in camera 
and then he'll play around with it a little bit afterwards to maybe speed something up or throw some visual effects like fake blood or whatever if he has to. But uh, and, and most notably in this film, I think the most important use of visual effects that they could not do in real life. Like, it's, it was too dangerous of a stunt. The gun was fired yeah, to the, the head? Yeah, the dragon breath gun. <laughs> Just kidding. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> the dragon breath gun, so that shotgun that spat out, like, uh, inflamed shells, they couldn't do that for real. They did light some of the stunt people on fire, Stahelski said, and Keanu said, but... The outside of that, that was just a blank gun. It was firing blanks. And so that had to be done in post. That's something, if you're spraying fire on people that aren't in fireproof suits, that's way too dangerous. So I would say that's probably the only stunt they had to do visual effects heavy work on. But still lighting guys on fire who exactly. were running around. But yes. yeah, all yeah. those shotgun shells were CGI and added in mm -hmm. post-production. And I think that was one of the best parts of the sequence of the one or over the head shot over above the ceiling that yeah. was so awesome it reminded me of constantine when he has the shotgun same and, and except yeah, when same. the water's coming down that was so cool i thought that was an awesome little reference Hi, maybe i'm john <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so much great practical filmmaking and clearly chad stahelski is really efficient because 90 million dollar budget this movie looks like it was a 200 million dollar movie because of the locations, yeah. the size of these sets, that club, they built those waterfalls all over those walls. That was all done practically in person. So, And obviously all of the guns and squibs and stunt people and stunt work and having trucks like the sequence where they were going around the roundabout in France at that arc and all these people are getting hit by cars. They're really hitting people with cars, although they had CGI giant pads that they'd slam into they're yeah. really only going about 10 to 15 miles per hour max for con for impact hits but still they're driving cars that are green screen padded and everything and smashing into yeah. them and we actually we learned a lot of background from Stahelski we got the inside scoop especially with that scene because people were really bouncing off of cars for real the stunt actors were really rolling into cars and like letting them lift them up in the air but then if say a guy was hit by a car and flew in the air they actually really did that but they had them on wires as well so that they could slow down their fall to the ground so that when they hit the ground, they weren't hitting it like with complete gravity full on onto the pavement. So they were able to slow their fall. That way they could realistically get hit, launched in the air, and then safely land on the ground. So they did a great job of trying their best to do as much wire work as they could to so they wouldn't have to rely on visual effects. And I think in terms of the production design, it seemed like they saved a ton of money by going, especially with all the scenes with Mark, the Marquis, with Bill Skarsgård's character. He's in incredible, extravagant locations, uh, especially the opening with his first scene with um, Donnie Yen when he's hiring him. Um, you, there's the, a couple of great, like, interiors, gigantic, beautiful sets. I'm guessing that they saved a lot just by renting one of those sets for a day and filming just that quick scene there rather than ha having an entire team build sets that's pretty expensive to do. So I'm guessing they saved a lot while making it look great by renting really incredible locations for maybe a day or two of filming, shooting pretty quickly. That way you have the style in the like elitist areas, these huge extravagant locations, up the production value. And I think they were able to save on costs by not actually building these things out. Yeah, because they're all over yeah. the planet Earth in this movie. They are traversing the globe. I mean, does John Wick have like f like frequent flyer miles? <laughs> like, what's going on? Does the high table? Is there have... a continental plane? I don't know. I but, wonder. But I mean, I will say I love John Wick. But like, how does he get all these countries so quickly, not being discovered by the high table? <laughs> <laughs> is he like? Is he like you taking know, boats? Yeah, you're right. They should have. They should, maybe it would have been helpful to show how he transport, how he gets transported. From but also, area. I don't want to see. I don't need to see. Yeah, it. it's, it's just like it's Batman important. getting back to Gotham. After yeah. Bane has him in in the in Morocco, in, the in Morocco, in the, yeah, exactly. same area <laughs> in the prison. It's the so same it's, like, it's like I don't give a fuck. I don't yeah. need to see it, but it's still funny to think about. Like, is like John like a like a American Airlines kind of guy, <laughs> or is, is he flying first class? You might want to avoid first class. You might get seen. <laughs> That's what I mean. Because the high table, what we learned in this movie, the scope of this this underworld just gets gets bigger and bigger with this franchise. And by the third one, it was really big, but by this movie, the Underworld of the high table, it's organizations, it's everywhere. It's so massive. Yeah. I was disappointed that we didn't get to see the high table. I thought yes. we'd be getting to see the real leaders of this organization, the people who run it, the people who call out all these missions and are in charge of everything. I thought we'd see members of the high table, but we got basically 
the the sons and daughters of the people of the high table because isn't the marquis his his father is on the high table. Is that what they said? I thought he was on the high table. No, it's himself. his father. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure. I, I've only yeah. seen it once. So I agree. I was hoping we would get to. I thought like we were gonna peak and get the final reveal of the world, which is who's really running things. Who are the people in charge of this hidden society hiding in plain sight? So I also was a little underwhelmed that we didn't get to see that table. Like we heard so much talk of it. This film this one in particular really uh, centers on the high table as a main plot device so i was uh, i was the same pretty disappointed that we didn't get to see like where is this high table do these people is it like game of thrones with the king's table where uh, the advisors and the hand of the king speak to the king or queen um for strategies and what's going on i was expecting like a table like that where there would be all of the highest members in charge of probably each faction or fa- major family or headquarters I was hoping to see that, and so when we were in the third act, I was like, I thought maybe we were going to see it at the finale for, like, witnessing the duel. I thought, like, the high table would come to witness the duel, but then when we got there, I was like, oh, man, we're just not going to see them, I guess, so maybe they're saving it for another film, but I I wanted to see them in this film. I wanted to see it in the third one. Yeah, yeah, the third one, yeah. I was like, there's no way we don't see the high table in In this movie. In the fourth one, yeah. Maybe the reason why we didn't see it is because this was initially developed as two films, so they were planning to make... John Wick 4 and 5 and shoot them back to back. And then Lionsgate even announced that we're working on the scripts for both films. So maybe they had stuff planned for for film 5 that they ended up saying, we don't really need this for the film once they reduce it down to one film, just on John Wick 4. So maybe they had more things that were threads that were going into reveals for the fifth film that ended up not happening. You know, I, I think that and also... I guarantee there was an original idea for this movie that was more John-centered because this movie, John Wick 4, or John Wick Chapter 4, I loved it, but it also felt like an almost MCU-level setup for characters for spinoffs, which I think was pretty obvious with the post credit scene that Tracker, the Tracker, as well as Akira, and oh, yeah, maybe Mr. some Nobody. other characters yeah. are going to get their own spinoff projects, whether they're TV shows or movies. So it felt quite like a bouncing board or like that was one of their goals of this movie was to make a trampoline for other characters. I would, yeah. um, Winston is getting his own prequel series that's being made right now uh, called the continental. Mm -hmm. So it's a Winston origins (laughs) origins. It's been a while since we had an origins on the show. So I will say as much as I really enjoyed the film, that was another con for me that it just, it felt a little too much like a modern comic book movie with, uh, establishing characters that they are setting up for films of their own or or TV shows of their own, and also I the post credit scene. Even Keanu made fun of the post credit. He made fun scene. of it in person. They came out, at, the film rolled, and then we stayed for the credits, and then they did the post credit scene, and it cuts right before like Akira is presumably about to attack Kane. We can assume. And then Stahelski and Keanu came out, and Keanu was like, "Why didn't you show it?" He's like, "Why do it if you're not gonna show it?" He's like, "He should have just, he should have just gone up and st- she should have stabbed, stabbed him the right head. in the yeah. throat, just like bop bop bop. Should have killed that motherfucker." Yeah. He's, he's, so he was roasting the post credit scene. <laughs> yeah, it was so. It was, Stahelski was like, "Yeah, I know, I know, I know." So maybe it's something the Lionsgate was really pushing. It seemed like that's it, yeah. my guess because. I mean, as in terms of post credit scenes, I didn't really like the post credit scene because they already they already established that Akira was gonna go hunt Kane uh, sometime in the future when she got off the train and he's and he said, um, but before that when he said I'll be I'll be expecting you, um, it basically was like uh, same thing that Beatrix says after she kills her in the kitchen. She says if you wanna if you ever want revenge, I'll uh, I'll be here. You're feeling sour. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of the same thing where. Kane said to Akira, like, I'll be expecting you to, like, get me, get revenge for this, so I'll be looking for you coming after me. So I didn't see the need to show the post credit scene because they established it in the film. You know, it was basically a confirmation of a, a new film with those two. So I thought the post credit scene was redundant and not necessary. Universe, man. Yes. It's cl- yes. So clearly this movie is a bouncing board to create... The John Wick universe, but at the same time, it worked so well as just its own movie at the same time. Oh, yeah. So I'm not saying that I I didn't enjoy it, but at the same, but you have to, I'm like, it's clear that that was like a map for this movie was to obviously end John Wick's story, which I'm so glad they did. Yeah. But also set up at least three more characters in their future projects. Do you think that uh, it seems like Mr. Nobody will get uh, his own spinoff as well? Yeah. So Tracker Nobody, basically the same character, I guarantee he'll probably get his own show. 
Akira is rumored to get her own show or, or movie. I mean, I think Tracker will get a movie And we as well. already have Ballerina is it's, in post-production. It's coming out in 2024, yeah. so starring Anna de Armas, which will have a like a guest starring role of John Wick by Keanu Reeves. That's probably the and last. And Winston will be in it as yeah, well. Yeah, and that takes place between the events of John Wick 3 and John Wick Chapter 4. Yes, Stahelski said it himself. He said it will take place sometime between then. So I bet you he's just in like a like an action sequence. Probably the same thing like Anna DeArmas did in No Time to Die. Yes, I think um, I think the audience will fucking freak out once Keanu <laughs> yeah. shows up. Um, so yeah, I agree. I, 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 I mean, we've said it before in a bunch of our reviews of modern comic book movies. We prefer standalone films where you don't like... Like team up movies, they're getting a, we don't need them every time. It doesn't always need to be setting up another character. So, but there are team ups in other genre yeah, movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I would say, but they didn't set up like a, a story for Halle Berry's character going forward. Yeah, exactly. Say. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So Halle Berry didn't feel like oh we're setting her up for her own thing because she's like I'm done. Like yeah. we're even, motherfucker. Even Steven. <laughs> So yeah, I agreed. It was different the way they approached it with Halle Berry. I think they did a better job with that. But not to say, I mean, it's it's going to be an expanded universe that I think has a, a lot of potential. I'm really curious to see Anna de Armas' film Ballerina, which is actually being made by Len Wiseman, who's, uh, he did the Underworld films. So if you're a fan of those films. Some uh, of the Resident Evils Re as well. Yeah. Mm, Paul, Tom, Paul W. Oh, Anderson. I'm sorry. My bad. It's okay, man. You only have a movie I got podcast. them mixed up. I got them mixed up. <laughs> and he also did um, Total Recall remake with Colin Farrell, which was uh, no point in even doing the remake. <laughs> but they had to. He's, he's, a, he's a very capable director, so I think that uh, it's in good hands. And I believe Stahelski is probably exec producing it, staying involved in what's going on with it. So the, I think that Ballerina has a lot of potential, and I'm curious to see... Where exactly all the spinoffs are going to be playing? Because I believe the first spinoff, the Continental, will be playing on Stars. So it seems like I think Lionsgate has a deal with Stars to show the TV shows, and then they'll probably theatrically releasing something like Ballerina and maybe another one. Now, John Wick Chapter Four. Basically, the plot of this film is John Wick's trying to uncover the high table as well as gain his freedom from the high table because there's still a bounty on his head, and he's obviously, of course, he didn't fulfill his blood oath which he was supposed to by killing Winston by cutting off his finger. Remember, that's the, the point of that in that last film was to save his life is he had to do that blood oath. And actually, the harbinger, the character in this film, also clearly had a blood oath that he mm -hmm. probably fulfilled with the high table because he's missing a finger as well. And he's a character who basically is the voice of the high table for us in this movie. And John Wick has obviously got this bounty on his head that's going up and up and up. And he's being tracked down by the Marquis, played by Bill Skarsgård as well as tracked by tracker but he's looking for refuge from friends in different parts of the of the world obviously going to um japan in the opening of the film to get refuge from his old friend played by hiroki sanada whose name is i just had it on my shimatsu shimatsu as well his his daughter kira who is kind of like akira akira who is his concierge yeah. in a lot of ways Obviously, Sharon dies in this film because the Marquis is basically cleaning up shop. He has excommunicated uh, Winston from his hotel as well as demolished the hotel and killing his concierge, Sharon, in the opening of the movie. And he's hired Kane, Donnie Yen, a super assassin, an old friend of John's, to take him out as well. I thought it was so smart to get two Asian martial arts icons in this film, Donnie Yen from Ch China and then um, Hiroki Sonata, Hiroki Sonata from Japan. And uh, Sonata has actually worked with Keanu in the past. They were in 47 Ronin together, so mm -hmm. he played one of the Ronin samurai in that film. That was only, that was made probably like six or seven years ago. Uh, Keanu hadn't worked with Donnie Yen, but Donnie Yen, obviously Ip Man, He's uh, acted and directed a lot of great uh, Chinese martial arts films. So he's actually a filmmaker as well, which is very cool. And then Sonata, I mean, Last Samurai is one of my favorite martial arts movies, and I just really adore that film. And he's Would you even call that a martial arts movie? Um, well, there's martial arts in it. I they do jiu-jitsu. Yeah, but I wouldn't really call it a martial arts All right, movie. All right, so yeah, but it's, it's one of my favorite samurai movies. It's one of my favorite movies. It's, it's, it, is, <laughs> it is one of my favorite movies, and it's one of my favorite film scores as well. And Sonata is an absolute highlight of that. But he's in, he's been in a ton of Japanese films, and he's doing a really good job breaking into American cinema here and there. He was actually in Avengers Endgame. He's in the opening. Hawkeye um, fights him in that alley. I think it's in Tokyo. Remember that reigning alley? That's who he fights at the end with in the opening of Endgame. Uh, that sword fight, um, and then Black Widow goes up to 
uh, Hawkeye. She's like, where you been? He's like, I got a fade. Got- <laughs> that so high, that, that's that Sonata. Fade. So you've seen him in a bunch of things if you did, if you weren't aware of who he was. He was in Bullet Train too. Yeah, Bullet Train as well. So terrific actor. So I, I thought it was so smart for them to get two Asian cinema absolute legends for this film. And when I that's what really excited me for the trailer. When I saw those two actors in it, I was like, oh, shit, they're going all out. Hiroyuki's in a bunch of more stuff. He's in the Army of the Dead. He was in Mortal Kombat, Westworld, also... Oh, I gotta see Mortal Kombat. He was in Minions. <laughs> <laughs> he was in, yeah, 47, the Wolverine he's in. So he's been in oh, quite yeah, a few, Rush Hour 3, mm-hmm. Speed Racer. He's in a bunch of stuff. Sunshine, he's one of the scientists and astronauts in Sunshine. That's right, he's in Sunshine. You're right. He's actually in a, he's in a bunch of He's Hollywood. a very good actor, not just martial arts, but he's a very good actor. He's got that presence, yeah. man. He's just like got the look, the cool factor. He's yeah. got it. Whatever it is for a movie star, he's got it. And I, I guarantee he's going to be playing like a lot of like – wise teachers as in his as he gets older like, he has that quality to him you know what i mean great voice yeah he just seems like he's got so much wisdom when he and, talks you just listen man yeah, he's got exactly. that quality to him <laughs> he also got he almost got like chopped in half in last samurai in a sequence when he was riding a horse in where, real life yeah where a stuntman didn't pull back the sword and he had to like dodge it Damn. <laughs> because they were using real swords for a lot of those fights. And uh, Kira, again, is basically his concierge and also daughter and one of his protectors and also a super assassin as well. We also have Kane, played by Donnie Yen, who is such a badass in this movie. He is beyond cool, the sunglasses and everything. And Kane is a blind man. And we learn throughout the film that he took his own eyes, what is you can assume, was a sacrifice to the high table. And it seems like to work for the high table or maybe to be hired for a job, you have to o- undergo extensive pain or some sort of blood sacrifice. I would say it's it's maybe the same thing as John where you have to overcome a mistake you made. Not necessarily a mistake. That's what I'm getting. Uh, no, I, not a mistake. Just you have to you have to so what show you, your no, you have to show your your devotion. So you think that's why Cain is uh, blinded himself? Yeah, he said, I gave my eyes. No one took my eyes. I gave them up. Just like when oh, Tracker I, gets no, hired, yeah, yeah, yeah. he has yeah. to give up the hand sacrifice. I'm guess, but what I'm saying is he gave up his eyes to, as a way of paying a debt to the high table is what I think it is. That's what I'm guessing. That's how I interpret that. Well, but Tracker didn't have a debt to pay. Yeah, he, he did was not. just showing his he devotion. Yeah. I think that's what it is, just to show a devotion. Yeah, but I mean, damn. Blinding yourself. That's but crazy. there is something in... in in Kane's past where his daughter is technically not free and he's trying yes. to free his daughter at the same time. That's why the ending of John Wick dying is so incredible because not only does he accomplish his goal of killing the Marquis as well as gaining his freedom, but he also gains the freedom for his friend who he's just been almost trying to kill at the same time for because, like the whole yeah, film. Because Kane has to, he does fulfill his duty. So he's he actually yeah. it's, a, it's a very worthy and, and incredible death for John Wick to go through. Yeah. But it seems like maybe but it seems like there's some sort of blood sacrifice you have to give as a form of devotion. For sure, yeah. Physical pain yeah. somehow because maybe Don maybe Kane did have a a failure in the past and that's why he's blind now. That's what I'm guessing because I'm sure there's a oath like cutting off your finger or whatever. And also the Marquis I think newly in power, so like that hand thing he did with Mr. Nobody. I'm not guessing. I'm guessing that's not something that's always happens. But my the way I interpreted Kane is that something happened in his past, and he owed a great debt to the high table. So the, to pay that, he had to willingly take his own eyes. Okay, yeah. So that's him, my guess. He and his daughter were not free until yeah. John Wick spared them. Exactly. But the, I mean, they, they didn't spare them. And, yeah. And then the the duel at the end. But they did a good job. You don't have to explain it. It's not important. It's it's interesting. They didn't have to do a flashback, you know. What I mean, I think that they're wise enough. Stahelski's like, I don't need to do a flashback. You don't. We don't need to have like a monologue of what happened to Kane and why he's blind. I think they did a great job of just giving us hints. The Marquis was a really interesting character. I love the suits. Stylish as hell. Great suits. Great suits. I just wish I we would have seen him fight. I want to see him fight John Wick because Bill's a good, he's a big guy. I think that would yeah. be really cool. I was hoping for a showdown, a, a physical showdown, because. No, I, I agree. But although I will say I love the duel and I love the ending. Oh, the duel is sick. I think the last 30 minutes of this movie is perfect. But I do agree. I would have. I was hoping that they were setting up a showdown between John and the Marquis because John kills so many people um, and he fights so many people kind of effortlessly in some way. I was hoping like maybe there's 
maybe the Marquis is an absolute fucking beast. And it could have been a great, like, one-on-one showdown, like an epic boss battle. Uh, that's what I was hoping to, they were building towards. But the duel, I think, ended up really working really well. Yeah, I think it just plays to the, plays to the character. He's brutal, but he's a coward mm-hmm. at the same time. That's why he has Kane fight for him. He's <laughs> he's going into the duel supremely confident, and then he nominates someone else to fight for him. And even mm-hmm. Kane's like, fight your own fights. I'm yeah. not fighting for you. Yeah. He's like, don't you want your daughter to be free? You're going to fight for me. Then obviously he's outsmarted in the duel, and I thought the duel was sensational because recently I watched Barry Lyndon for the first time in the last <laughs> month, and there's a couple of duels in that movie that are awesome, incredible scenes. And as soon as the duel is going down, I'm like, oh yeah, Perfect Barry timing. Lyndon. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah, but Skarsgård did a great job. His French accent was sounded legit. He, I was like, oh man, he's really pulling off the French really well. Like I, I feel like he's a French actor right now. Yeah, he's awesome. Because um, great actor. Yeah, I mean, the, all the Skarsgårds are great with accents because. They have. They actually all have Swedish accents, but they've uh, eliminated their accents as actors. So it takes a lot of work to be able to do that. I mean, you're not going from like getting rid of your Boston accent to be a straight American accent. You're like you're getting rid of a foreign language accent, speaking English. So they're yeah. very talented guys when it comes to that. I really enjoyed being in Osaka at the Osaka Continental, and as soon as you know the high tables guards showed up and. Uh, Hiroki goes to his men. He's like, we have guests. Show them hospitality. I'm like, oh, they're going to pull some swords Let's on Arthur. Then they start getting the bows and arrows, the, yeah. the stars, the, the swords. I was ready for like a great battle, but I was a little disappointed that it ended up just being kind of shooting arrows from like the second story and then kind of being taken up by all these guys in the suits. I was expecting more of like a samurai showdown between a bunch of people with swords. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. I see. So that's what yeah. I was expecting. Arrows versus guns. Because Arrows I love bullets. sword fights, and I, there are yeah. so many good ones in this movie. Donnie, I mean, Kane has some great ones in this film as well, and he's just magnificent with the sword, just like going all over the goddamn place. And when we were listening to the Q and A with Chad and Keanu, there was someone asked about. Uh, Donnie Yen and how what it's like working with him in a scene in, a, in fight choreography and Keanu's like yeah so this is what happened me and him had this fight and we planned it out and we were supposed to do this and that and then Donnie just starts doing this crazy shit everywhere and John's just standing and I'm John just standing like alright this isn't gonna work we're gonna have to change it uh, up. He, he's basically too slow to block any of his yeah, hits because Don, Donnie Yen's yeah. so fast and so skilled not that Keanu's not but Keanu's like alright we're gonna have to change up because this isn't gonna work <laughs> <laughs> and then they had just Ke- I mean John Wick basically just like runs away in one of the scenes yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm not fucking with this guy right now. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> That's how great Donnie Yen is, is because they had an idea going into the shooting of how they're going to fight choreograph the scene. But then he's just like, they're like, all right, not only is he too fast, we have to take advantage of it and use it. Mm-hmm. So let's change this up and just do it on the spot. Yeah. And they were talking about how much of the choreography is done day of is quite a bit. They planned out, obviously, a lot of the main moves for the fight sequences in terms of like, Guns and swords and, and major and combat. blocking, but yeah. you, they said you'd be surprised how much it is day of or the day before, just before filming, just kind of figuring it out in person what's going to work and what's not going to work. Especially a lot of the judo moves and a lot of the ju- jujitsu for sure. And also, I mean, they obviously train in they train in open warehouses in with big matted floors, and um, sometimes they can like build like rudimentary sets out of like maybe cardboard or whatever, to so they know kind of like what an environment would look like that they're working in. But I think with John Wick, from everything I've seen, they just are on open floor plans when they're training. And so they'll choreograph ideas for fights, but they won't really know until they get onto set what that environment is, what the space is like, where walls are. Are there any physical impediments? Like, for example, the ga- the art gallery room. Like, There's a lot of just pieces of art and blocks and structures throughout the entire floor plan. And that's not something that they can really plan ahead of time. They can plan out ideas for the fight, but like it's not until the production team the morning of or the night before builds that set and puts in those final pieces and then the team shows up in the morning to start shooting. Then they're like, okay, this is what we're working with. So they can only – it's actually better, I think, that way. That's probably why they've moved into that in terms of their, how they shoot. You can plan ahead, but also you you can plan an intricate fight and choreograph it to the T, but then you can tell a location it could be like this won't work at all. So it's smart of them. I'm sure they've learned from experience that it's best to have a general idea of what we're going to do, then, but then wait till we're actually standing on the set and see how it can work with our fight. And what I love about John Wick movies is 
the unique kills. And every movie has given us so many new the kills, brutal kills we've never seen before. Obviously, we've got the pencil reference in this movie for sure with Kane. But I'm always like, all right, where's the really cool kill going to be? Or where are they going to be? And they managed to pull it off with some new things that we've never seen before with this one as well. I think maybe of all the fight sequences and all the the weapons used, my favorite was probably when John found the nunchucks. And yeah. it was like the John Wick style of nunchucks. Clearly he's used them before, but you can tell like it's been a while since he's picked up a pair of nunchucks because it took him a minute before he got used to like doing the cool swings yeah. and like putting it under his armpit and everything like that. But the way he was using it was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to use this to bash people in the yeah. face with two hands on the nunchucks. It wasn't pretty. It was not beautiful. Yeah, it was not graceful like Bruce Lee or anything like that. But I, just, I thought that was one of my favorite parts of the movie, just John with the yeah. nunchucks. He's using it kind of like a fucking baseball bat, just like swinging it into people's faces. Yeah, that, that was my favorite part part of that fight definitely the nunchucks and i really i think the, the best death was killer's death when he just fucking falls like four stories oh on God. his head and the whole audience gasped but then in osaka uh when they're leaving the rooftop uh and some one of the soldiers got shot like in the kneecap and it got stuck to a wall and then he like tipped upside down and got head uh, he head shot and he was just like dangling from his knee the entire audience reacted really well from that one yeah. there are definitely some good kills this episode, of course, is sponsored by our great friends at MoviePosters.com. Be sure to use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library. If you want some John Wick posters, the place to do it is at MoviePosters.com. They are also doing the Movie Poster Giveaway Contest in this episode. So if you have not yet entered... Head on over to our John Wick Chapter 4 review on YouTube. Make a comment in that comment thread that enters you into the contest drawing. We'll pick a winner in one week. Thanks to MoviePosters.com for running this contest for us. And if you want to get some posters, be sure to go there and use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. I would say one of the more impressive stunts that I saw... It probably was the most dangerous was one stunt guy just fucking jumped down an escalator and fucking just landed like the down the entire escalator just planted right right onto the metal uh, platform on the bottom and you could feel it and they really shot that I saw behind the scenes of it and they really filmed it like the the stunt actor really did that and that was insane but then also the stairwell there was a certain stunt actor did the, that, stairs? The, stairs, the stairwell? The stairs. Okay, yeah. the, the exterior stairs in, in um, Paris. Uh, they said one stunt actor did it. I can't remember the actor's name, but he was the, the Paris stunt actor for John Wick. And he did that. all of those sequences of falling down the steps. No wire work. He obviously was padded up, but he really did that over and over and over again. And it was really, that was a really stairs. Those are concrete and stone. It's like, that's not padded. It wasn't like they built a set that was safe for him. Like, he really did that. And I'm sure how, I don't even want to know how many takes he did of that because there's, there's quite a lot of footage of it that we saw in the movie. He's got great form. Yeah. But, man, <laughs> he was and he was rolling down those steps. Like, it's cruising. But that was a great um great stunt. Obviously, extremely dangerous. Like, extremely dangerous, especially with an exposed head falling down like that. Uh, but that guy really sold that scene, really made it work because that scene was one of my favorite scenes because of the comedy. It was like silent film era comedy, like something Buster Keaton would do. And so I thought it was so much fun to throw that in because John got all the way up, up to the tippy top, and then he falls all the way down. And to actually see it, him really hitting every step on the way down was really funny. I, it was one of my favorite parts of the movie. Yeah, it's hilarious. The crowd reacted so well to it because he just keeps going and going and <laughs> going and going after everything he went to just to get to the top of the stairs. And now he's falling all the way back down. And it was a great reference to Buster Keaton because there's at least two or maybe three movies that Buster Keaton did where he goes upstairs and then falls down. Mm -hmm. Some Sometimes it's just the stairs become like a ramp flat, down. Yeah. Flat. But that, that was a great ode to the great physical comedy of the past, which they definitely incorporated in this film. I would say that this might have the most physical humor of the entire franchise, which I think the crowd really responded to so well. Yeah, because, I mean, stunt actors, I mean, it comes from comedy, from the from silent film era. That's like the birth of stunts. So I think it's, it's a great thing to be able to throw in that physical comedy into a film like this because obviously the films are mostly pretty serious. They can, you get the most fun out of the deaths 
So I like the change of pace of getting fun with just comedy. And that's something I don't think I saw in any of the John Wick films where like you'll get people will go crazy from like an awesome death or some crazy kill. But to actually get them react that way with comedy, I think was great. And also I elbowed you like halfway through this film and I was like, Mission Impossible Fallout. Yeah, yeah, you can they, see the influence. Yeah, they used a lot of scenes from Mission Impossible Fallout, a lot of the sequences and environments that they used in in uh, Paris when they filmed that there. Um, also, Fast the locations. Te- yeah, Fast X. I don't know if you've seen that trailer. Same thing. They used a lot of the Mission Impossible Fallout locations in, in Europe uh, for that film, for sure. And obviously, I mean, these are obviously very famous landmarks in the city. Um, but I, I think there was maybe three. So it was the, the big roundabout and then the underground canal. And you can tell it's, they have, it's like a specific canal in France where uh, there are like holes in the roof of the canal, which are like gated um, underground holes like in like that park. You know, I, I don't know what you, how to describe it. It's hard to describe, but you know what I mean. I know what you so, mean. Yeah. <laughs> we're there with you, man. There are holes in the ground. Yeah, but they did... Um, like a drain. But they were smart about how they filmed the same locations because they filmed them at night, so you have a different look. That way, it's not like too easy to notice. But I think that we're starting to see how influential that film, especially Mr. Christopher McQuarrie being such a great action director and his influence on action cinema. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, I think that John Wick influenced Mission Impossible Fallout. Oh, for I sure. I think specifically that bathroom fight in Mission in Mission Impossible Fallout. I think they took and a the lot, club. I think they took yeah. a lot of inspiration from John Wick because we weren't really getting those great fight sequences in every Mission Impossible. We were getting fight scenes, but like not to the level that. Yeah, we I'm trying saw. to think. In Mission Impossible Fallout, that bathroom scene was fucking awesome, and I'm like, this feels like a John Wick fight. It's so cool. I can't think of a of a Mission Impossible fight like that before that scene. But I love when you see huge action franchises or just movies in general just paying respect to each other and taking influence from each yeah. other because it just steps the other's game up. And mm-hmm. like, oh, they did that. We have to do this. They did this. Yeah. We have to do that. And then also, Keanu and Tom are two of the best. I mean, stunt actors and drivers of motor ve- of motorcycles and vehicles. I mean, Keanu. And Tom are so good at um, what they do. It makes like Ch- Stahelski, He he spoke about it in terms of how it, how easy it makes shooting something like this because with every major stunt sequence, whether it be a fight, whether it be some stunt, whether it be driving a car or driving the motorcycle, they don't have to train someone to do it. They don't have to find people to do all these certain things. They just say, Keanu, this is the move. All right. Do that because he's so good at driving that they don't need to waste time prepping because they already have an actor who can do basically all of it. And so Tom and Keanu are so similar in that way where they really benefit the production. And Stahelski, because the the interviewer asked him, like, how do you do this in time? How do you this much take forever to shoot? And he's like, honestly, we can only do it because Keanu is so skilled at all of these aspects of stunt work and driving. And this film has a couple of my favorite vehicle sequences so far in the franchise i think that uh knocking the doors off that muscle car and then he when he starts spinning around that group of criminals shooting them through the door the open door that was one of my favorite parts of all the entire franchise that was fantastic and it was like he's just like spinning the car up for literally 30 seconds (laughs) straight it was great i could have watched that for 10 minutes yeah (laughs) and he's really doing that he's he's a stunt driver there's no cgi like well that's the thing it's not that it's like making the production easier it's that you can get actual real footage of the character you mm-hmm. can see his face while he's doing oh, the yeah, stunt for sure for sure rather than having to do different shots or pick up shots or try to hide oh, a stuntman's yeah. man's face absolutely and also they they talked about how they blocked the big sequences like the club fight was a definitely a highlight of this film because uh, there's so many bodies there and um it was interesting he stahelski was basically saying uh, we block it with the the main actors and then we start building out groups of extras so we'll we have the blocking for the fight for the sequence for that day and then once the actors have it then we bring in like a group of 20 extras and tell them the choreography and then they block them out then we bring like another 20 extras and they work on their blocking and then they keep building on that until they have like 200 extras and everybody at that point when they're ready to film knows exactly where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there and it's basically like a big huge choreographed dance in a way and i, I thought it was a really fascinating insight into how they because that club sequence in particular, 
there were so many bodies on the floor. There's so many people. So it was a really impressive sequence blocking that and filming that and making it make sense while also being an entertaining fight sequence. And he said that he wanted the waterfalls and the walls because he said his father did that in their home or something like that. They, he his says fa- his father was a plumber. Yeah, yeah, and he built a wall, a waterfall wall in their house. And he's like, I want to, cl- to make a club and I want all the walls to have waterfalls. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. And they that fucking was, did it. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and he also kept talking about how like, He's like, there's so much extra footage not used in this movie. This is a three-hour movie almost. And he's talking about there's like there's so many extra minutes of fight scenes, whether it's in the club. He said there's a lot left out of the club, a lot of great deaths yeah. he said that they had to cut, as well as a ton of fight sequences and action sequences in France at the roundabout, at the arcs. He said there's so much stuff that didn't make the film, and it's still two hours and almost 50 minutes. They also cut out an entire thread where John gets the three pistols. Yeah. Because they they do an insert shot of when John shows up at that place, and he takes out three pistols, and they, they, sh- they film, like, close-ups of the pl- pistols. It's because Tehelski... And the crew, they filmed an entire sequence of him getting those pistols at different areas, but they just cut it all out of the film. So those pistols were actually had a lot more um, backstory where he got those in the film originally. There's a lot more story in, when he's in uh, Berlin as well, in mm-hmm. Germany. So he yeah. said they, they cut a ton of stuff from Germany. I bet you there's a lot of dialogue that John Wick had that they cut from this movie as well. I'm sure. I, I do think that the film ran a little too long. What do you think? I think it ran, uh, for me, I, I loved it. I'll watch it all yeah. day, but still, from a story-wise, it felt like it ran a little bit much. I feel like they could have shaved 10 minutes off, and I do think as much as I love the action sequences, and as impressive as they are, and I have nothing but respect for the stunt teams and the coordinators and all the people that are performing. I do think that some of the sequences, they went a little too long and they kind of lost their impact a little bit where it was just like, here's another guy for him to judo. Here's another guy for him to grapple. Here's another person for him to grapple and then shoot. So I think that it might have been too many bodies. The body count was too high, I think. And I think if they trimmed down the fights a little bit and made them a little shorter... I think it overall would have helped the pacing of the film. Because so, I feel like as cool as the fights were, sometimes they did drag a little bit where it was just like, is this? are they ever going to stop fighting? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that I would say so maybe it was a little too much of a good thing in in some regards. But I think Chad Stahelski is also like, fuck it, fuck it. This is the style. I got the money. This is the style of the movie. Oh, he's people, loving it. People yeah, are going to love he's it. He's loving it. No, I mean, I love it, but I just felt like Maybe it kind of some of the sequences lost a little impact by extending them for so long. You know I think what I mean? so. Sometimes when it's like the the seventh random guy with a gun that John is yeah. grappling and, and jujitsuing for yeah. a little bit, it's like speed up a little bit. <laughs> Speed up a little bit. They could have cut a couple of them out. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Did you know that? Um, so the guy who plays Killa, Scott Adkins, mm-hmm. this is the guy with the fake teeth, the metal teeth in the front, the gold They're teeth. Gold, yeah. The gold teeth. And I knew he was gonna pull one of those teeth out because yeah. they kept showing those teeth. The gambling scene. So that's Killa. He's actually in a fat suit, but that because that guy's in like yeah. crazy good shape. Yeah. And I didn't expect him to start like d- doing those like Jump ra- kicks. roundhouse kicks. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> that was funny. It was a lot of fun because I was I was wondering. I was like, why did they have a guy in a suit doing this performance? And then they started fighting, and I was like, oh okay, this is fun. Really good prosthetics though. Solid. Yeah, look, and that actor did a great job. It, but it, it was really funny. It was fun to see the, a person of that size moving like that. It was. It kind of felt like it was like a it, maybe like an anime or something that was like. Like kind of impossible for them to move that fast and that have that time kind of agility. Yeah. <laughs> but like in in real life, but John Wick is a heightened reality in a way. Definitely. Well, I mean, uh, it's he, suspension of yeah, disbelief. Yeah. I mean, Absolute he, heightened reality. What's his kill count in the franchise? Like yeah. a thousand people. Yeah. How many? How many? Like, because like the thing is, you accept it, but one of the biggest things for the heightened reality is the bulletproof vet, uh, suits, the ballistic. Oh, the Kevlar suits. Yeah. Kevlar suits. Um. And just like running into bullet fire because like even if you the Kevlar suit was a real thing, if you got shot in the shoulder, it would like jump your shoulder back. And like if you got like a shotgun into the chest, you'd be thrown to the ground. And so obviously no one's really reacting like that. They're just like kind of running into gunfire like point blank range. You accept it because it's John Wick. It's heightened reality. It's, it's, cheat like, code. it's like fuck it. It's like whatever. It's not – this isn't like Saving Private Ryan. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so you accept the Kevlar suits, um, and then it, it, you, you just once you accept that, it's you have more fun with it. Yeah, I sometimes I'm like watching. I'm like, is, are these getting out of hand? But at the same time, it's like it's just fun. It's just John. It's Wick. so cool. Yeah, it's just John. Wick. Like, I mean, yeah, he's holding up his suit jacket from to yeah. Because I mean, if, if you had the blazer jacket, 
obviously it's Kevlar, but like a bullet would still like hit you. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it, would, would, it would hurt. It would it would cut. It would like bash your cheek open. Yeah, it would go through the jacket <laughs> yeah. and like, just smash you. It like punch yeah. you in the face. Yeah. But um, at the same time, I'm also like, it's so cool. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, Who whatever, cares? Whatever. Fuck it. It's yeah, John Wick. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Bullet, bulletproof suits. <laughs> I loved uh, what, some of my favorite kills were when he was killing guys with the car, just like ramming into them. Yeah. Those were great kills right there. I loved them. The driving sequences were awesome. And I, I think that just the fights in this movie were excellent. And man, they, they just went to town. I bet you, watching this movie, it seems like it was such an exhausting film to make. Yeah. Like how much work went into it every day, just the stunt fighting and just day to day, just... These guys are in such good shape, and the endurance that they, even just Keanu has to have, like constantly moving every scene. The guy is fighting for his life. He looks like the best shape he's been in since in, in any of them, honestly. Like in terms of like how he looks, like he's obviously not as fast as he used to be. Yeah, it's noticeable. Yeah, yeah but he looks like he's in for being fifty-eight years old in ridiculous shape. It's absurd. Oh yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. But, but the stunt team, so a film like this, they have a stunt team of 30 people, Stahelski said, and these 30 stunt guys and women, like, they're just playing, like, b multiple henchmen. And what, yeah, what he was it's talking about, yeah. he was talking about how the first film is really just judo and handguns, yeah. pistol fighting, and how they've just slowly incorporated more and more martial arts. And basically what they do is, obviously, they have a, an idea and locations. Obviously, they're in Osaka, Japan, so you're going to take martial arts that are based from there as well as some other countries, depending on the, where they are. But also, he says, we have our crew of stunt people, and basically, we work with what people's strengths are. If someone's good at this, we incorporate that into a fight. If someone's mm -hmm. better at that, we use that for a fight. I think that's a, a really great way to just kind of have like a, a Swiss Army production of just like whatever, Swiss Army knife, whatever you need, you can mm -hmm. use and just do it into the scenes for at the moment. It's a great point. I like that. It was, it was really cool to just hear him talk about stuff like that. And I like the um, the Osaka armor, how it harkened back to the ancient samurai armor, but like with like combined with like modern SWAT gear. Yeah. It was pretty cool. <laughs> it was pretty badass. <laughs> I loved it. This movie's excellent. I, I There are some still big questions about this movie, I think. I think some people might wonder, is John Wick actually dead by the end of this film after the duel? Ah, oh, come on. He's, he's dead. He's definitely dead. Yeah, I think Keanu's dead. done. I think you could tell, like, this is probably a really exhausting movie to make, as much fun as it probably was. I think he's done with John Wick. But I think that the duel in the ending was so satisfying for fans, the way that yeah. Kane and John go out together, basically, and... Basically, it's a shootout. A, a, a I love duel. when they join forces. Yeah, I loved it. But then just outsmarting the marquee yeah. and take the marquee out basically together. They both get freedom and they both take out the marquee and they don't have any more obligations to the high table, which I thought was such a great ending. I knew John was going to die, but I, I was really pleasantly surprised with how it happened with him killing the marquee, tricking him. I thought that was great, but I knew he was going to die once they started talking about tombstones. But the third fire, like, he's dead. When Kane shot John, I'm like, did John fire his pistol? I was like, did he, did he shoot? Yeah. I don't think he shot his gun. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, nice. But then Good I was eye. like, Good then eye. I was like, is it because he got shot first? But I'm like, What's going I only on? heard one gunshot. Yeah, I, I noticed that when we were. Nice, nice. Yeah, but yeah. once they started talking, once John said, loving husband on my tombstone, I was like, oh, he's dead. He's Definitely. so dying. Another question I think people might have is, was Winston. John's father, because he says that um, uh, goodbye, my son, to his grave, right? I think that he's just a father figure to John. He's not actually his father. John's an orphan, and I don't think Winston is his father. Obviously, it, it could be possible, but I think that in terms of a blood relation, I don't think Winston is his father. I think it's just like more of a, I've been a father to you for many years. Yeah, I'd say absolutely not. Isn't he Russian? Uh, John? John? Well, he's an orphan. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. wasn't he from Russia, yeah, though? Yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense for Winston to be his father. No, no, I'm just I'm get questions. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking it out. I'm not saying... Oh, I thought, you. I, no, no, I'm just... I thought you were coming at me, bro. No, I'm just thinking out loud. Don't worry, man. Don't get insecure. It's okay. I got this. <laughs> I'm saying it wouldn't make sense to even question that because John's an orphan from Russia. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm just saying these are questions people Why have. would you ask that, Jim? Why would you? Don't you understand what I'm saying, Jim? Next question <laughs> that people may be taking away from this film. Does Akira kill Kane in that post credit scene? I wish she did. We'll find out. I bet you they have a, a crazy fight in the public right there. My my thing is, so her her project, is it going to open then? Is it going to like, is that, is that film or that TV series going to open with her like attacking him in the public square? So I, that's why I'm not a fan of like a uh, post credit scene like that. I mean, it's. I mean, if you're gonna show a new character or reveal something, yeah, that's fun. But like in the middle of an action moment, like 
I thought it was. I did. I'm just saying. I did not like that post credit scene. Yeah, it just takes away from the movie that we just watched. Yeah, and we just experienced in like promoting John Wick Four and, and experiencing that because now all people can talk about it. is like, oh, what's gonna happen next? Yeah, rather than just enjoying the moment. Mm-hmm. I think it takes away from the film. Just live in the now, man. Live in the now. Live like we just now. watched a three-hour epic action movie, yeah. and it's like now you want us to just only care about what's coming later. Yeah, if, it's, if, it's if, bit, yeah. I mean. If you're uh, gonna do it, just like like Keanu said, just shove that razor in his throat and just stab him to death. Like they should have just done it. If they're gonna do a post credit scene, I think it would have been better to re- reveal a new character instead. Instead of because I'm saying like you know what, it would have been cool if she if if the post credit scene was her attacking Kane and killing him. That would have been sick. That would have been cool. But to cut it right as she's approaching him with the razor in her hand, I was like, it's petty. I was like, you guys really cut on that? I mean, we love you, Lionsgate, but it's it's petty. I was like, did you cut on that? Come on. (laughs) But if she, like, went to, like, a different continental and they revealed, like, a really cool character. I thought, so I said before the film started, I was like, I bet it's a post credit scene and I bet it's Anna de Armas. So I was wrong, but I I was right there would be a post credit scene. It would have been, like, imagine the uproar. If it was Anna? If it was Anna Armist, the crowd would have fucking exploded. They yeah, would, I think people so, would have, too. People would have lost their minds. That's what I was expecting. Someone would have had a baby. So, uh, yeah. so like, if, imagine if Akira went to, like, wherever Anna Armist's ca- ballerina character is and went to, like, her to see her, and then it's just, like, Anna Armist. Cut to black. That's a better post credit scene, I think. I, I agree, man. I, I, absolutely, I absolutely agree. Thank you for agreeing with me. I think just... Post credit scenes are just so gimmicky these days. It's they, just they it's can just be, become yeah. just a thing. It's like, yeah. do we really need it? Mm-hmm. Do we do we really really need that? I mean, do we? Do we? The studios want them. They, yeah, Lionsgate is 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 building a wick verse, and you can't blame them for that. It's guaranteed money, and it's something people want. So you can't knock them for like go just following the crowd. You know what I mean? They're just doing what they do. I I really liked. Kane though is the blind assassin. I thought it was really interesting and the different techniques he uses to fight whether it's sort of like kind of like what you can assume is maybe some sort of sonar where he's just kind of making noise with the sword like rubbing against things as well as when he was in that kitchen scene with the the sound the doorbells the, the, yeah. Yeah, the monitors. I thought it was really interesting because he's clearly was probably he's such a skilled assassin, martial artist, the character Kane that even as a blind man, he's still just as good. And but he's done it. He's adapted into what his handicap is now in terms of having cut his own eyes to lose his sight. And he's he's clearly much better with hand to hand combat because I like how in the kitchen scene that that you just brought up, he set the alarms up, the motion sensor alarms for whenever the guys walk past, and then so like say example like a guy passed passed by one of them and the and the doorbell went off, he would just fire at them, but he often missed them. You know what I mean? He missed them a bunch because he can't see them. He knows like the general direction, but it's not like I think it. I think I would not have liked it if he just kept like headshotting people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it would have been like that's unbelievable. It's too like mystical. Yeah, but because the, it works because he also plays a blind fighter in Rogue One. Yeah, and it works really well in that movie because he has the Force. I am the for- I am one with the Force. I'm one the, the Force. force. So so yeah. he has the Force with him, and so you accept that. Yeah, but. This one, they they made it work in a different way. Yeah, because if he was shooting people, no problem. It, I would have been like, come on. But he was like shooting in their general direction and oftentimes missing. And just more using it as a way to break people up and just yeah. get them panic closer to them. him. Yeah. yeah, make them panic. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, will he be a, uh, is there going to be a third movie where Donnie Yen plays a blind assassin? He said <laughs> he want, He said he wants a spinoff. Yeah, he wants his own spinoff? Yeah. I would watch a Kane spinoff for yeah, sure. I'd watch a Kane spinoff. I think that would be really cool. He's a great character. He's the coolest person in the movie. I yeah, think. he's one of the best characters we. I think he's he could be the best character outside of John in the he franchise. He just oozes cool. He's so cool. Donnie yeah. Yen is just mm-hmm. like such a badass. Mm-hmm. I, it just works. So yeah, I'm guessing. So my guess for spinoffs, it seems like Mister Nobody will have a spinoff too, um, because he obviously wanted the bounty. But since John saved his dog, and you saw how much the dog meant to him, then he saved John. I really like the dog and how he's like, what does he say, nuts? Yeah. He says, nuts. Yeah, not, nuts. Get the- nuts. <laughs> we needed a dog. Yeah, you got to get the dog in there. It's part of, <laughs> part of the John Wick uh, lore. You got to have a dog somewhere. Mm-hmm. And th- th- w- there was a great dog reveal of one of the henchmen when the dog comes out of the darkness. That was a great reveal. <laughs> that was great. That was oh, awesome. Shit. 
<laughs> Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose he'll get he's they seem to be setting him up for a spin off as well. Seems like it. Yeah. So Seems we're gonna like get sure. so Tracker, Winston, Ballerina, Akira, Kane. And Kane. So that's five the, spin-offs that's right John there. John Wick verse. The Damn, Wick verse. That's a lot of spin-offs. Oh my God. It's a lot. Whew. Well, I think they're probably going to wait and see how Ballerina does. Well, they'll maybe like start developing these other ones. Well, I mean, the Continental is coming out soon. On so Stars. The Continental is TV series on Stars. Stars Ballerina is yes. going to be a theatrical release yep. mm-hmm. for Lions. That comes Gate. out next year. If they pull that off, man, this will this will pop. So I will say there was something missing in this film. We got a little bit here and there. Uh, gore. Uh, the first couple especially did a fantastic job with gore. Um, and even the third one as well, especially with like the, the knife fighting. Remember he stabs, he just stabs the guy in the fucking skull. Uh, there were a couple instances like Killer's death. There were a couple of nice kills. But uh, I felt like they, I was ex- hoping for more gore and more like crazy gore to see in this film. Um, so I, I was hope I, I think that. Especially the first few films did a better job of, of depicting Yeah, gore. I guess the blood was minimal. Yeah, it was, pr- it was, it was it. pretty minimal, I would say. Maybe they didn't have enough money in the visual effects budget to... Yeah, maybe they just had to work fast. Yeah. Um, but I would say that something, like, halfway through the film, I'm like, I haven't seen much gore. There's been a couple of things, but, like, not really too gory of a John Wick movie. You know, it's probably a continuity thing, especially when you're filming in all these fight scenes yeah. over and over again on sure, set yeah. the day. I bet you there's a continuity issue if you're using practical blood. Yeah. And visual effects blood, they probably just spent on the, the action sequences, whatever yeah. they needed. But that's why I think that the knife fight's my favorite fight in the franchise. That one gets pretty bloody. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, more blood would have been cool. Mm-hmm. I love blood in movies. <laughs> it's Ooh. great. Ooh. It makes it come alive, man. Ooh, it's coming alive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there were a couple instances, and you, you could see the audience, because it makes a difference. Like, when the audience really reacts when they see, like, blood or splatter or, like, crazy gore, then you, everyone comes alive. Yeah. And it makes a difference from the other kills where they'll just shoot someone in the head or, or like, get throat, like, underneath a mask or something. The music was great, too. And when the John Wick theme comes in, the, it was, it was yeah, pretty Tyler awesome. Bates. Yeah, Tyler yeah, Bates they, did a good they did job. did a great job with the music mm-hmm. as well. Cinematography was awesome. You know, this probably won't get any awards recognition, but, you know, it's it's one of the best shot films of the year so far. It's absolutely. the best shot of the franchise. It's it's visually one of the best films of the year, I agree. Especially great with, colors. Yeah, so they do a great job with it's not Like, it's not just neon. Like, I, I think it kind of gets that, like, that's that term slapped on it's neon uh what the cinematographer and stahelski do is they obviously it's it's colorful lighting but they wisely use opposites on the color wheel so they'll do red and green contrasting and then they'll do cayenne and yellow contrasting a lot and it's the most appealing thing to the eye the human eye when we see opposite sides of the color wheel contrasting together Guillermo del Toro does it a lot that's why most of his films have the the cayenne yellow uh, colors in the same frame contrasting one another they use that they utilize that a lot in this film there's an entire sequence I think it's the Osaka sequence it's all green and red green and red because they they're on opposite sides of the color wheel they and they make our they clash so well that like it, our minds love it our eyes love it same thing with cayenne and yellow that's why Christmas is green and red <laughs> that's Shit why sells. that's why <laughs> so they're 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 wisely they're not just lighting it with like yeah just make a bunch of colorful lights they're doing it on purpose and from what I could tell every scene had two main colors and they were opposite ends of the color wheel great point man thanks man great point appreciate it this movie was loud bombastic and epic oh, yeah. I, I enjoyed the hell out of it even though it ran almost three hours I still had an absolute blast John Wick Chapter Four was an awesome ride. What a great conclusion to the character of John Wick. Yeah. I think that he's dead for sure. Maybe we'll get, we'll obviously see him in Ballerina. Hopefully not too, I don't want to see him for too much in that movie. Like, I just want him to come in real quick. Yeah. Because I want Bal- I want Anna de Armas to, you know, not be overshadowed in that film. I, I, I'm I putting my money on it's going to be like Anna's cameo in um, No Time to Die. No Time to Die. It's going to be an action sequence they do together. Like a 10 minute sequence. And then he'll be out. He's like, all right, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> Hey, we should work together sometime. <laughs> That's what I'm guessing it's going to be like. And it'll be fun. It'll be great to see. It will be. Looking forward to that. Again, that's going to be 2024. We'll have the Continental as well. We'll, we'll yeah. check that out when that's coming out on Stars. And I know we had a couple of cons for the film, but I still gave this I gave this film an 8 out of 10. I, I, thought, gave, I thought I'm it giving was it a great. 9. I thought it was great. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. I thought it was great. 
having a great time. Yeah. But I give them all. I have every John Wick movie at a four point five, except for number two. I have a four. Uh huh. So every one of these movies I rank at at, at a nine ish. Well, that's what I was saying when you compare it to the Matrix franchise. This is so superior because it's got the consistency of they're all really good. Well, I mean, the Matrix is the superior of every. Well, so yeah, the thing yeah. is like. If this I had to, one if, movie, if, that's how great that one movie yeah. is. For me, if I had to choose between watching The Matrix for the rest of my life or watching John Wick's one through four, Matrix, I would choose The Matrix immediately. That, but that's me, and that's how I special I think that film is. I'll just close my eyes during Resurrections. <laughs> I wouldn't even watch the others. I just I would just watch The Matrix. No, where you had to. I had to. If an, I had endl- to, an endless loop of Matrix Resurrections of all four of all four. Okay, so if I had to do all four... If you four- had to do an endless loop of all four Matrix movies or all four John Wick movies, what are you doing? <sighs> I mean, <laughs> The Matrix is that good. <laughs> I might go Matrix. The first Matrix. Because is, the first Matrix is that good. Is that good. <laughs> yeah, I don't hate Reloaded, man. Yeah, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I think it's an uh, overhated movie. Yeah. It's got a special place in my heart because we loved the hell out of it when we were 10 and it came out. Yeah, we fucking ate that we shit thought, I thought it was the coolest movie ever. I mean, that freeway chase is sick. It's fucking awesome. It's, great, it's a great it's chase. Awesome. It's a great sequence. They built yeah. that highway. Yeah, it's They great. built a whole mile of highway for that. It's, it's a crazy sequence. That's man. insane. And yeah. that entire wall. They built that. Yeah. They built the wall. That's crazy. <laughs> and Carrie Moss did a lot of her own driving yeah. on that motorcycle. She did, both, she did basically all of it. Yeah. And oh, actually, that reminds me of Chad Stahelski explaining how they shot the, the big roundabout in France, how they're using real cars and they're really running around on the lanes. So they he said that... Each lane was color coordinated with cones, and so whatever sequence they were shooting, like this color is where the cars will be going through. This color is where the humans can safely be in in this lane. So basically, he's like, it was kind of just like safely, like the best you can, make sure you're right in, in the right colored lane, yeah. so you don't get hit by a car. But also, the cars at max were going about 15, 15 10 miles per hour, yeah. especially for impacts. But obviously, the close-up shots and speeding up a little bit, they look like they're going faster. But yeah. safely, especially for the impacts, they're going about 10 miles per hour, max 20 miles per hour if they're driving past people. But they basically, yeah, they had color-coordinated coordinated lanes so that you could know which lane was going to happen and where you're supposed to be. Yeah, and, and but they did say, if you, Keanu was like, stay in your lane. <laughs> if you don't stay in your lane, you're getting hit by a car. Yeah, just, just be really careful. Yeah. And again, the, a lot of the cars, if they were getting hit a person were padded with CGI pad or green screen. So pads. they were hitting them for real, but yeah. they were padded. Yeah. Green screen. So you got padding. the impact. So that's really cool. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. It's very smart. <laughs> it looks great. It looks it fantastic. Yeah, it, they're really there filming it. Mm-hmm. It's in the camera. That's why it's awesome. This movie's fucking awesome. It's sick, but I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed got it. Got anything else? I am very happy with how it concluded. I'm glad that we're only getting four John Wick, John Wick movies and not extending it on. Um, Keanu did his part. He is one of the greatest action stars to ever live. Stahelski has proven himself to be one of the best directors of action in the modern era. I can't wait to see his Ghost of Tsushima film. Man, I hope they fast track yeah, that. I have high hopes for that. And then I'm looking forward to seeing Anna de Armas leading Ballerina next year. Then we got the Continental. So the John mm-hmm. Vick universe is just starting. <laughs> Are you Austrian now? German. John Vick. I don't know. The John Wick universe. It's getting going. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least it's not the end of the road begins now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in to our review of John Wick Chapter 4. Please become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. At a minimum payment of $2, you get access to our weekly chat, which is now exclusively going to Patreon, and a weekly bonus episode on a movie topic. Minimum of $2. We also have a $5 $10, $25, and $100 tier patronage on Patreon.com. Each P- tier gets you awesome perks. That $10 tier gets you access to our Discord. It's an incredible film community. We also do watch parties on there a couple times a month. We're watching a Dragon Ball Z movie tonight on oh, Discord. Yeah. Anime night. Should be fun. And then at $25 tier, the Godfather tier, you get your own custom episode. You pick a topic, and we'll do it just for you. And then that $100 tier, it's the chosen one package, the Neo package. You get everything we've mentioned as well as some other perks like you get free merchandise as well as a custom watch party. You pick a movie, we'll watch a, a viewing party with you about that. After three months, you get to come on the show for a fun guest segment and an intermission, then going a little further into the topic, as well as you are getting a shout out at the end of every main episode in an executive producer credit. It's a lot of fun. 
We're happy to everyone who is a patron. And if you haven't joined, do it today. Take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.